Hello there, I'm Aiden. And I'm Erica. And welcome to A Pastor's Life for Me. All right, so this is the follow-up video to our last video on the peace definition. I did have a script and a whole thing planned for this, but then I decided it might be better if both of us just told you the story. So it's gonna be a little bit of a different format, but it's all based off of Philippians chapter four in verse seven, which it says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. So we're gonna tell you the story about a uh, difficult time in our lives with the birth of our son uh, and how we were able to have peace during that, even though it was a very crazy situation. So my pregnancy with Judah was not normal. Um, for the first six months, I was basically sick the entire time. And when I say sick, I mean, I probably, anytime I was awake, I was throwing up. Uh, I couldn't really eat anything. And when I did, I threw up. And when I wasn't throwing up, I was sleeping. Um, they tried multiple nausea medications. It took, I think three tries to find something that actually helped me keep my food down. But towards that point in the pregnancy, it was already nearing the end. So I got probably about two months of that pregnancy that I wasn't sleeping and throwing up. And you lost what, 10, 15 pounds? I lost quite a bit of weight and the doctor said at some point if I lost any more, they were gonna have to hospitalize me. Um, I wasn't fully honest with the doctor about how sick I was. I think they probably should have hospitalized me sooner, but that didn't happen. <laughs> During the pregnancy, along with the sickness, I was also very like rock solid. Um, my ribs were being pushed on, which I know is a normal thing in pregnancy, but this was to an extreme where like there was no give and I couldn't even always feel the baby kicking at all. Like I was just so rock solid. There were times that if I got a cold, I couldn't breathe. I would cry because I could not get enough air in. It was actually really scary um, to feel like you couldn't breathe. So there is a reason behind all of this that we'll get into later. So we were out fishing when her water broke. It was the first time out camping since our honeymoon and we were there for like three hours. So that was, uh, that was fun. So then later, in the morning at about two, we drove into the hospital and we'll save you the details for the next 12 hours, but everything continue on, continued on pretty normally. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Um, but then when it came time to push and Judah came out, he, he came out with a wave. It was, uh, yes, there was a, a extreme excess of amniotic fluid that came out with him which it was why her stomach was so hard and it was, felt like it was crushing her rib cage and she couldn't breathe. But after that, then it all seemed normal. They took Judah and then they started doing their usual tests and then they gave her the baby and then all of a sudden we're hearing these codes go off for our room. They called, what is it, a code blue and a code pink? And so then all of a sudden you got 13 doctors and nurses coming into the room and they're trying to you know, debrief as to what's going on, and Erica is clueless at this point. She's completely out of it, uh, focusing on Judah, which is actually what they wanted. Uh, and it turns out she was severely hemorrhaging. And so then they started a uh, second IV, and then they were contemplating on starting a third one to hook up blood to, or something like that. So though she was completely clueless as to what's going on, I wasn't, um, and I was able to see all the blood, and there was a lot of it and you know, things were going pretty, pretty hard, pretty extreme for 19 minutes, I think it was. By the 19 minute mark, they had finally got the bleeding starting to slow down and by the 24 minute mark, uh, the bleeding had stopped, but it was somewhere around a liter and a half of blood. And by the 17, 18 minute mark, uh, they were determining if they needed to take her to the OR and to potentially start prepping that. I think we can both agree. It's definitely not an experience we wanna go through again. And they actually said we probably shouldn't have kids within five years of this event just because of 
the damage that it would have done. After that, things went, I guess, normally-ish. Um, you know, we go back to our actual room that we're going to be staying in for overnight and the few checks that they do, uh, the calling in a family, all that fun stuff that happens. Everything was seeming to go normal, except that uh, Judah was puking quite a, a bit, like he's having the spit ups and... So my biggest red flag was that he had been born for quite a while and he hadn't eaten once. So I was exhausted from the hemorrhage. Aiden was exhausted. We both slept. The nurses took him to the nurse's station and he didn't cry once. He didn't look for food once. And this is over like a couple hours. He hadn't eaten anything. So then when they bring him back to us, I tried to nurse him and nothing. He won't eat anything at all. And then he's still puking while not eating anything. So at about 6.30, um, yeah, he was still puking quite a bit. And Erica noticed that it was a little bit off colored, but nobody else could see it because your receiving blankets have those patterns on. So it all sort of blended together. Um, but then he threw up again and she was able to catch it in the blanket and instead of wiping it off. And so then she showed the nurses and then the nurses recognized that it was bile and that is not a good sign. So then they called the on-call pediatrician and he was sent down to get an x-ray to make sure that everything inside of him is, is going on because an x-ray is the least amount of radiation that they could have given him compared to like an ultrasound or other equipment. What they did right after the x-ray was laid him back. They um, put a tube in his nose to suction the bile so that he wouldn't choke on it throwing it up. And then um, they did an umbilical line to get some nutrients into him. Um, from that point forward, we couldn't hold him because with an umbilical line, you can't jostle it or move it at all. It's Temporary. So of course we're very worried because something is seriously wrong, but we have no idea what it is and not really any idea what's going on. And so at about 9.30, the pediatrician came in um, to talk with us about the situation. And through the x-ray, they could see that there was no air or oxygen going through Judah's bowels. And so basically they had the line going down his system until it hit the bowels and then it just stopped. They could see two bubbles towards part of the bowel, but they didn't know what those bubbles were. They couldn't tell us, was it a blockage? Was it a kink? Was something formed wrong? Is there more bowel below those bubbles? They could just say, there's a blockage of some sort. These bubbles are proof. All I can tell you is there's a double bubble in his intestine. And to the extent of that, because um, they said he could just be missing his entire organs or sections of it um, and that they wouldn't know what to do about it or what it was until they would actually have to cut him open uh, because you can't put that much radiation on an infant. So they couldn't do an ultrasound like they would do uh, for an adult in that situation. And then of course, the hardest news was that they, they have to inform you that there is a possibility that he might not make it through the next few days because of this. Neither of us really remember too much about the, the news they were given. We each remember bits and pieces. Um, me because I just don't remember and her because of the, the lack of blood and just not being all there. And so, I mean, of course the news is gonna be devastating. You're, you're told that your, your newborn child uh, has, has to go and have a, this emergency surgery uh, and that there is a chance um, both that he could die from the surgery, just not having enough nutrients over the next couple of days, his, his body not accepting certain things. Like there's a lot of factors within the next three days that could kill him. And so, you know, we're devastated and, and terrified, but then at the same time we had this peace come over us and that sort of, you know, we have more of an understanding of like, of like when Paul says the peace that surpasses understanding because you know, we're terrified and scared of this whole situation, but then at the same time, we know that God's in control and whatever the outcome, even if that was his death, uh, we know that he's sovereign and in control and that we can still have peace in him and that we can still trust him. Uh, and so that's sort of where, like in our last video, when I talked about 
you know, how you can be terrified and depressed, but still have peace. That's our example with it. Cause it's not like we went into this state of tranquility where it's like, Oh yes, our son is, is, could die. We're okay with that now. Like it was nothing like that. But at the same time, it's knowing, you know, that we can trust God in this situation. So then it, then it was decided that I would be airlifted with him to uh, go to this bigger hospital in Saskatoon. Um, and Erica, like, they didn't actually even want to let her go to Saskatoon, but they knew she would be near a hospital and then she had to sign a waiver. I basically left against medical advice. Um, they said, I'm not risking my life by leaving. However, they would prefer me not to but because of the circumstances they let me i just had to sign a waiver and uh basically i was supposed to have probably two transfusions throughout the next week if i were to stay and they said since i was not doing that that i would be on high doses of iron for the next two. six months yes six months for the next six months and i wouldn't be able to pick up anything over eight pounds for about the same amount of time. So I wasn't gonna be able to pick up my daughter for over six months. And like the effects from that lasted well past three years. Yeah, um, I battled low iron. I was sick all the time. Um, yeah, it was horrible. I mean, it is a little bit crazy, but I mean, no parent is gonna make a different decision. And just like medically you can lose 40%, like up to 40% of your blood before you pass out. And so getting close to two liters is still, uh, at max she would have lost a third of her blood, but probably closer to a quarter. And I had to be wheeled around everywhere because I couldn't oh, yeah. actually walk without blacking out. I would tell the nurses, I'm fine, I can walk. And then I'd start to, and then I'd go just head first towards the floor. Then I'd wake up in a chair and ask, why is everyone hovering around me? Um, yeah, I had to be wheeled everywhere for a while. So there was actually a chance that she could have died from it. Um, and then if it started again, that was also a big risk. But because she would be traveling up in the next couple days to the hospital, I think the following evening she got there. Um, Jude and I arrived at the hospital at 4.30 in the morning. They checked him into Nick U and then I spent uh, next three hours sleeping in a spare room somewhere. So after I woke up, I went and spent uh, the, as much time as I could with Judah. And then uh, the doctor came and we went off into a private room and uh, my grandpa was there with me because he lives in Saskatoon. So he was there to help support us. And so she debriefed us to the situation that was going on um, to give us further clarification on, you know, what was the game plan. And so, she reiterated what the pediatrician at the hospital told us about his situation. But then she said uh, the plan for the next three days is they want to wait until he's three days old, maybe till five days old, um, so that his body could build up more strength. And so he was uh, on an IV that was giving him all his nutrition, uh, which they called a banana bag. So I got there that evening and I don't, remember a whole lot. I do remember being really mad because my husband went and wheeled me through the hospital and I wasn't too happy about that. I, I was pretty convinced I was fine to walk. Um, but anyway, he wheeled me up to the NICU and we went in and saw him just laying flat out on this like bed with a heater over top all these wires hooked up to him and they had a diaper just to cover him but it wasn't like done up because there were so many lines all over his body that they couldn't actually put the diaper on all the way and so they went through a brief tutorial of the NICU um, how to change your child's diaper and stuff like that but they also went over the rules of what we could and couldn't do until the surgery the big rule with that we were like allowed to touch his hands but really not anything else like his hands and his head but that was after we had done a complete sanitization um so that we didn't risk him getting sick because if he got sick then um then there is the risk because they can't do the surgery with that and then that's extending it longer and because he's got a line that's not going to last for more than a week or so and so yeah it was hard for the next 
two days like just to be there with him because he's got so many wires and you know they say oh the wires look worse than they are but that's more just something that they're trying to comfort you with but like those wires were keeping him alive because he couldn't digest anything because they don't know what's going on with his bowels because there's not really any sign of life in his intestines now i don't know which was harder for me the uh when we were told the news uh when he was born or the weight that we had while he was in surgery i don't know about you definitely just saying goodbye to him going into surgery because we didn't know if he'd come out or not and then so we had to meet with all these different doctors and so i held it together to a point and then they said, okay, we're going to wheel him off now. So I said goodbye. And then that's when I start like hyperventilating and crying. And then someone else comes up to introduce themselves. So they try and keep you calm through all of this because it's hard enough already. Um, but there are a lot of factors. Um, and if you don't know um, how dangerous it is to do surgery on a newborn, the anesthesia alone can kill them. And so he's got to be put under anesthesia. He's going to be in surgery for four hours. Uh, they're going to cut completely across his stomach. So he'll have a scar all the way across. They only have about 500 milliliters of blood. And he had lost weight as well. So that would have gone down. But losing a little bit of blood when you're that age, um, when you have that little amount of blood, uh, it can kill them. It can kill them pretty easily. And so, yeah, we're sitting there in the waiting room up by the NICU, trying to stay somewhat calm and not panic about it. Um, and it was difficult. Uh, we still have that peace going on that, you know, it, it's gonna be all right. And so they told us, um, do not expect to hear from them for at least four hours, you know, four hours at minimum. And an hour and a half into the surgery, my phone rings. And it's like, I'm sitting there and it's an hour and a half in which means that this call is not good. So I don't want to pick up the phone, but I also need to pick up the phone. And I remember looking at it and I think Erica told me to answer it or something like that. And so I did. And they said the, uh, the anesthesia process and everything took much longer than they had anticipated. And so they hadn't, they hadn't actually gone into surgery yet. And uh, I felt like I would need surgery from a heart attack after hearing that phone ring. Um, cause that, I don't know. I think that moment was actually the, the most my heart like went beating like crazy was when the phone rang. And so he said, yeah, it's, it's just going to be longer than, than they thought. And so we took him down at 1030 in the morning. Uh, surgery was supposed to start at 11. Uh, I got that call at probably around noon, uh, 12 to 1230. And then we got a text at about five o'clock, 5.30 uh, in the evening saying, uh, he started by saying all good news, just so that we wouldn't panic and so that we would be reading his message. Um, he told us where to go down uh, to meet with him, uh, where he would debrief us about the surgery. He told us that the, the operation was a success, that uh, once they got uh, the incision halfway across his stomach and they didn't have to go all the way they were able to see clearly what the problem was. Um, and it was that he had two kinks, one in his bowel and one in his lower intestine, which would have been the two bubbles that they saw um, on the x-ray. Uh, and so basically they just unkink them uh, as much as you can. They couldn't completely unkink. And like when your intestines are all jumbled up, um, which is what they call malrotation, it can't be fixed because if they were to tamper that much with your intestines, your intestines would go into shock and just stop functioning altogether. Um, so what they do is they just unkink them and that does still traumatize the intestine and bowel. So his intestine and bowel won't function for another week or two um, following that. And along with that, his appendix was on the opposite side. So they removed that and um, we found out that we were very blessed because his intestines didn't show, usually when blood supply and oxygen is cut off to a part of the body, it's gonna die. In his case, they did not have to cut and stitch anything other than when they removed the appendix. Um, 
he didn't lose any of his bowel or his intestine. Nothing had to be resected. It was all still perfect and functioning. As soon as they unkinked it, it pinked right back up and went back to the way it should be, I guess. Yeah. They said it was one of the, the, the best outcomes that we, we could have gotten with it. Um, and the big worry being with if it is a kink is that your whole intestines could have died. Um, cause if it was tight enough to stop the oxygen going through and it was enough to a, a degree because they couldn't pick it up on the x-ray, which is how they knew it was, was wrong. But this whole issue with him was actually the cause of everything that had happened, uh, from the pregnancy because his intestines aren't in the normal order. Like that's what malrotation is. So his whole layout with organs are, are just different, especially in the intestines. And so while they were forming, they formed with the kink in them or kinked at some point, which caused this excess of amniotic fluid uh, surrounding him because basically instead of digesting it properly, he would just be spitting it back up in the womb. And so that's why Erica's stomach was so hard. And that was actually the cause for the hemorrhage because what happened was when all that liquid came out with Judah, her body couldn't contract fast enough um, as it's supposed to, which then caused the hemorrhage. Yeah, the uterus couldn't shrink back down afterwards because it was so overstretched with the excess fluid. So this whole event, situation, everything that happened was, I mean, it was very stretching. Um, it took us, definitely took us like in a new level in our relationship between us and then even with the kids, but also like with God and, you know, being able to have that peace um, where, you know, I, there were times where we didn't think that he would make it. Um, and of course that's gonna be going through your head and it's like you almost wanna prepare for that but at the same time you don't. And like I know that that first day with, with the birth, you know, to the people that I love the most, almost dying um, just with everything going on. And, and you know, it's difficult. So then going back to the question of this video, you know, how did I find peace in, in this you know, this crazy, terrifying event. Well, I didn't, you know, it was, it was given to us. It wasn't like in this situation, it wasn't like we had to beg God for, for peace. Um, you know, we were praying about uh, the whole situation, this whole, the whole time. And it was just something that, that came over us. And I'm not saying that that's going to be the situation all the time with, with everybody, because we do need to pray and we do, do need to ask God for peace. Uh, but at the times when we need it most, if we're trusting in him, he'll just give it to us. And to recognize that, you know, peace doesn't mean that you'll get the outcome that you want. And that peace isn't just this lack of emotion that you have. That peace is trusting God and knowing that, you know, even if our son died and even if my wife died, we would have been okay because, you know, God is with us. And our story... You know, it didn't end after the surgery, though, you know, the surgery was, you know, the, the big starting event of everything that happened. The next three years were very difficult uh, with medical reasons. We were in the hospital generally at least once a month, if not twice a month for, uh, for different reasons. Not just with him, but with the medical issues that Erica has had and that I have had and that our daughter has had and then medical stuff that Judah has had that what this they say it isn't even related to uh, the defect. And so we obviously don't know where you're at and whatever your situation is. Um, and we don't need to know, but God does know. And so he took care of us in our situation. And even if it, if it went the way that we didn't want it to go, he'd still be taking care of us um, because he's a God who loves us. Uh, and he's a God who will comfort us even through the hard times and who will give us peace if we ask for it. And again, that doesn't mean that you'll get the outcome that you want, but it does mean that he is there for you even when that happens. And that, you know, if you are saved, if you are in him, he works out all these situations for your end good. He's there for you and he always will be. And I think, I think we've held Judah off long enough. Judah, come here. We didn't even tell you to take off your shirt and apparently you come out shirtless and your pants are on backwards. Yeah. I mean, this on 
going backwards. So this is Judah, the child of the hour. Can you say hi, buddy? <laughs> Judah, how old do you turn at your next birthday in July? How old will you be? Is that four? Yeah. Four, yeah. Hello. <laughs> so as I said, this is Judah. And yes, he is turning four in July. And that's actually a, you know, a pretty big deal for us because well, each time that his birthday comes around, it's a reminder to us that, you know, he might not have been here if things went differently. <laughs> so you can see right along here where his scar is, it is definitely the most ticklish spot on his body. <laughs> right there is where they put in his central line and that's where he got all his food and all his nutrients. And then that right there, that little line is where he had one of his IVs. So we are definitely very blessed to still have him in our lives, as well as Naomi. And they are always wanting to film with me and I can hear them in the background while I'm doing my videos, shutting from their rooms. Welcome to A Pastor's Life for Me. Subscribe to the channel. Good job. <laughs> like this video. That's right, like this video. And leave a comment with you know your stories about how you, you found peace in, in difficult times. Uh, but that's all that we're gonna have for today. But until next time, remember to know the word, do the word, and share the word in love. Now my turn. Now your turn.